How you doing? I'm Callan and this is Slapped Ham. Today we're looking at some scary historical events that no one can quite explain. So hit that subscribe button and get ready for more creepy content. Just like this. In 1966, the Pritchard family moved into a house in East Yorkshire. Jean, Joe, Philip and Diane thought they were the sole residents of number 30 East Drive in Pontefract, West Yorks, but quickly found they in fact shared the space with something or someone else. The unexplained occurrences began in the family's first year at number 30. Pools of water inexplicably formed, lights turned on and off, furniture was overturned, and other objects levitated inside the home. Photographs were slashed. At times, the home filled with an unpleasant odour, while on other days, the family could clearly hear heavy breathing. In time, the family began to catch glimpses of a figure clad in black robes. Parents, Jean and Joe, were the first to spot it, but before long, both children spotted the figure as well. As the Pritchards began looking for help to deal with their alleged supernatural guest, investigators also started seeing the mysterious figure. Because the garment resembled a monk's black cowl, the apparition became known as the Black Monk of Pontefract. Others became involved in the investigation. A number of exorcism attempts failed as vicars, local police, paranormal investigators and even the local member of parliament attempted to help the Pritchards with the haunting. Daughter Diane, aged 12 at the time the family moved into the home, increasingly seemed to be the object of the ghostly monk's attention. This would prove important as one paranormal investigator finally began to track down some answers. Tom Cuniff worked for years on the Pritchard case. Knowing that paranormal activity usually takes place in a location relevant to its presence, Cuniff began to research the history of the area immediately around the Pritchard home. What he found began to connect the dots and explain the monk's actions, even if he couldn't stop them. Cuniff discovered that the town gallows had once been situated across the road from where the Pritchard home stood. It was on that site where a Cluniac monk had been hanged years before for the rape and murder of a young girl. The victim was close in age to Diane Pritchard, thus explaining the monk's fascination with her. The Cluniac order was known for wearing black, providing further evidence that the apparition may have been the murderous monk. Over the years, several paranormal investigators have captured photos that may show evidence of the Black Monk of Pontefract. Claire Cowell captured this eerie image in 2016 when investigating the property. In it, we can see a black vapour down the end of the hallway. Cowell believes it looks like a hand carrying rosary beads. Pete Poulton and Rob Hughes from Ghost Inspectors Paranormal Group snapped this photo that seems to show a mysterious figure in a downstairs mirror. Today, the house at number 30 East Drive still stands, and it even hosts visitors who hope to catch a glimpse at the spirit who dwells inside. To this day, objects have been seen flying around the house, eerie whispering has been heard, and that mysterious dark figure continues to be spotted on occasion. There are just two rules for those who visit the home, no use of Ouija boards on the property, and no attempts at exorcism. Many paranormal cases feature a haunted place, but sometimes it appears to be a person who is haunted. In 1938, Alma Fielding was, by all accounts, leading a fairly normal life, until terrifying and unexplained things began to besiege her in her home in Croydon, UK. Dishes flew off their shelves and shattered on the floor, sometimes they cracked while in her hands. Heavy chunks of coal and other household objects levitated or even sailed across the room, drawn by some unseen force. The events in the Fielding home were witnessed by Alma herself, her husband Les, their son Don and their lodger George Saunders. In her desperation to find answers, Mrs Fielding pleaded with the local newspaper to come and document her experiences. When observers visited, what they saw horrified them and thrust Mrs Fielding into the forefront of the emerging field of paranormal research. The field of the paranormal was an emerging area of study at the time of the Fielding's incidents. 
One researcher, Nandor Fedor, saw the newspaper account of the unexplained events at the Fielding home and suspected it was more than an ordinary poltergeist. Instead, Fedor believed it was not the house, but Elmer Fielding herself that was haunted, or more accurately, subconsciously causing the frightful incidents by directing energy generated from emotional trauma. Fedor's theory was situated at the curious confluence of Freudian psychology and the unexplained. To test his theory, Fedor had Alma Fielding accompany him to the International Institute in Kensington. While he ostensibly planned to conduct interviews, medical investigation and supernatural examinations with her, a significant part of his plan was to separate her from the house to determine whether she or it was responsible for the phenomena the local paper had documented. Fedor set up several scenarios to test his theory, and even he couldn't have dreamt that he would get his answer so quickly or in such a horrifying way. Almost immediately after their arrival in Kensington, Fedor observed frightening happenings around Elmer Fielding. Items materialised from thin air seemingly summoned from her home back in Croydon, as if Elmer's mind created some type of portal that could transport things across space. A protracted investigation never led Fedor to a plausible explanation. Despite his dogged determination to find some source for her episodes that would free her from accusations of mental illness or fraud, he was certain that her husband's trauma during war, her own monotonous daily routine, some repressed memory from childhood or a combination of those factors was responsible for the trance-like state she usually entered as her frightening episodes began. Fedor's pursuit of answers became so outlandish that it even led to his removal from the International Institute. Yet his exhaustive efforts perhaps provided the most terrifying explanation of all, that Alma Fielding's experiences had no reasonable explanation. In November of 2011, Latoya Ammons moved with her three children and her mother, Rosa Campbell, into a home in Carolina Avenue in Gary, Indiana. Within weeks, the home's screened-in porch became populated with large flies, a very unusual occurrence for December in northern Indiana. Further, it seemed that no matter how many flies the family killed, more came in their place. The greater terror began when Latoya's children became the target of strange events. It started with her 12-year-old daughter, whom Campbell allegedly discovered floating unconscious above her bed. The child eventually returned to her bed and awakened unaware of what had just happened. The woman consulted with clairvoyants, who told them that the home was possessed by more than 200 demons and urged them to move to another home. Because the family couldn't afford to move, they took one clairvoyant's advice to construct an altar in the home's basement and recite Psalm 91 aloud in the house. This step brought the family three days of peace before the possession resumed worse than ever. This time, the spirits escalated their attacks by adding the seven and nine-year-old boys to their list of targets. The boys would develop evil smiles and deep, otherworldly voices as their eyes bulged. The younger son spoke to an invisible child who was describing to him what it felt like to be killed. Ammons herself would develop physical sensations that she believed were moments of possession. When she pursued medical advice, the boy's doctor allegedly witnessed the younger son being lifted and thrown through the room. Both sons cursed at the doctor in a demonic voice before passing out. An ambulance was called, joined by police officers, and the boys were taken to a hospital. In the emergency room, the older boy returned to normal, but the younger son became so violent that it took five men to hold him down. In the chaos, someone reported Ammons to Child Protective Services, fearing that they had been abused or exposed to drugs. Perhaps the most striking thing about the case at this point is the growing quantity of documentation from professional and separate parties, testifying to the nature of the possessions. The doctor, a psychiatrist, hospital staff, police and child services all created records of their interaction with Ammons and her family, leaving a horrifying paper trail of what was going on. This included violent verbal threats from the boys and, perhaps most frightening, an episode of one boy walking up the wall and across the ceiling. With no other solution for the children, authorities removed them from the home. 
Psychological examinations and legal proceedings followed, but most significant was what took place in the home. Eventually, social workers and police visited the home with Campbell, offering them a glimpse of what was taking place and even sending it with them. Police radios malfunctioned after visiting and the caseworker for the children experienced a severe headache while in the home. A priest who heard of the family's plight eventually performed multiple exorcisms on Latoya Ammons that finally freed her and her children from their tortured condition. The reunited family moved to Indianapolis, leaving the possession behind in the house on Carolina Avenue. In 1971, Colin and Leslie Robson were digging in the garden at their home in Hexham, UK, when they discovered two small stone heads. Roughly the size of tennis balls, the heads appeared to have been carved with grotesque faces. The boys soon reported strange goings on in their home. The heads themselves would allegedly move when left unattended, relocating across the room without intervention. Bottles would launch themselves across the room, the apparent power of the heads even reached into the home next door, where the Dodd family reported that their son's hair had been pulled. His mother described seeing a half-man, half-goat figure walking through their house. Soon, the heads were passed along to Dr. Anne Ross, who was an expert in Celtic artefacts. Immediately after she took possession of the heads, she began experiencing strange phenomena as well. Like Mrs. Dodd, she spotted a half-man creature inside her home, but in this case, it was half wolf instead of half goat. She tracked it through her house before it escaped her sight. Later, her daughter reported a werewolf-like figure leaping the banister inside the home. The introduction of a wolf into the situation suggested a possible link to the Hexham wolf that had killed a number of animals in the community in 1904. The wolf had escaped from a local zoo and attacked several livestock in the area before it was struck by a train and killed. Speculation quickly linked the wolf's violent death to the discovery of the heads and their apparent influence on the well-being of those who handled them. A twist in the story developed when a local concrete worker, Desmond Craigie, came forward with a plausible story that he had made the heads for his daughters in 1956 when they lived in the home. He even created new heads as proof, but most who viewed them agreed that they were poor facsimiles of the original. The heads changed hands a few more times before disappearing without explanation. Their current whereabouts is unknown. Before we take a look at a truly puzzling case that went down in Braxton County, West Virginia, remember to caress that subscribe button, then tickle that little bell icon there and turn on all channel notifications. That way you'll be in the loop every time we drop our scary and mysterious videos. On September 18, 1952, brothers Frederick and Edward May, joined by their friend Tommy Heyer, reported seeing a bright object fly through the sky and land on a farm owned by G. Bailey Fisher in the community of Flatwoods, located in Braxton County, West Virginia. As they left the area, they stopped at their home and told their mother, Kathleen, what had happened. She called West Virginia National Guardsman Eugene Lemon, who accompanied her, the original three boys and several other children, back to the Fisher farm. When the party reached the site, they noticed a pulsing red light. They directed their flashlights on the source and spotted a large human-like figure with a broad hood and small hooked arms. Its red face was shaped like a spade from a playing card with glowing orange eyes. The figure hissed and began to drift towards the group, causing Lemon, the guardsman, to drop his flashlight and scream. At this point, the rest became frightened and dispersed. Upon their return to safety, the group reported some type of odorous mist in the area of the siding that left them nauseated and suffering from throat irritation for days. The local sheriff had been investigating a report of a plausible plane crash in the same area, but found nothing. Later on, a newspaper reported apparent skid marks in the area and some type of thick, gummy material on the ground in the area. This soon gave credence to the theory of a UFO landing that was quickly linked to the figure seen by the Mays and their group. A variety of theories have emerged that attempts to explain the Flatwoods monster as a barn owl and the physical reactions of the investigators to exertion and hysteria. 
Yet, there remains no detailed explanation that ties together the Bryant line, the evidence of a possible landing, and the mysterious figure itself. The mountainous nature of the area would have offered many routes for escape and hiding that anyone or anything could have easily avoided detection. The bright light in the sky has been linked to other sightings of a meteor in the area on the same night, but anything entering the atmosphere would resemble a meteor beyond a certain distance. Given the proximity of the maze and Tommy Heyer to the only other unexplained events of the night, it would seem that their account carries considerably more weight than that of people who saw nothing more than a brief flash of light from hundreds of miles away. The explanation of the witnesses' physical symptoms falls short as well. While it's true that anyone can experience nausea, vomiting and throat irritation when frightened or exhausted, these symptoms usually fade as soon as a person calms down, gets some rest and perhaps even some hydration. The witnesses had their symptoms for days, a situation far more similar to exposure to mustard gas than to simple fatigue or fear. So what actually happened in Braxton County all those years ago still remains a mystery to this day. Now, if you want to see some more freaky clips, then check out that link on the top there. Otherwise, we have these giant paranormal playlists right there for you to binge on. Now, if you want to get your name scrolling along the top there, consider supporting our Patreon campaign. There's a link in the description box below. And that's it for me. I'll see you all next time. 